I'd like to uh, read with you from the Gospel of John, please, chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're going to read the story of the healing of a nobleman's son, son of a man from nobility. So John chapter 4, and we'll begin at verse 46. John 4 and 46, if you're following along, I'm reading from the King James Version, and it says this, John 4, 46, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Or unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of that inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend, when he began to improve. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. What was the result? And he and he believed himself and his whole house, his whole household. This is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. <clears throat> so this is a story we often refer to as that, the story of the nobleman's son. A man from nobility had a son who was near death. And he needed a miracle. Anytime I read this, I think of a, a famous quote from Queen Victoria, who was, of course, from nobility. And she, she said she was always thankful for the letter M in the Apostle Paul's statement that not many noble are called. Not many noble are called. She, liked, she was thankful for the letter M. Otherwise, it would have been not any noble are called. And here we have this story of a man from nobility who has a son who's so sick, he's, he's at the point of death. And there are a lot of lessons that we're going to learn from this uh, healing story. There's so many healing stories of Jesus in the Gospels, and, and many of them are, are emphasizing different things. In, in other miracle stories, Jesus would, would often prove that he was Lord over disease, Lord over disease. Uh, people with afflictions came to him, and, and he would he would heal them. Sometimes it was leprosy. Sometimes it was, you might remember the woman that had a, an issue of blood, and she came to Jesus. But he proved over and over again that he was Lord over disease. He had power over disease. There, there were times when he proved that he was Lord over, de, over demons, casting them out at his command. He had power over demons. He even proved on a few occasions that he was Lord over death. There are at least three individuals that we know of during the time of Jesus that he raised from the dead, the daughter of Jairus, the widow of Nain's son, and then his friend, Lazarus. And of course, later on, Jesus would prove the greatest power of all over death was after he himself had died. He raised himself from the dead. So some of his miracles proved that he was Lord. He had uh, power over disease. And some of them proved he had power over demons. And some of them proved he had power over death. But in all of those miracles, Jesus was there physically to perform them. But here's a story where Jesus would prove he had power over distance 
that he could actually perform a miracle and not be where the person was. And I love that. I love that thought that Jesus didn't have to be where that son was in order to bring about his healing. His miraculous powers would travel faster than the speed of light to produce a miracle in the life of this man's son. He's Lord over distance. And I'm glad as we sit here today, I'm sitting, maybe you're not. I'm glad as we sit here today, Jesus Christ is still Lord over distance because he's not physically here on earth. And yet from his right hand in heaven, he can do a miracle in your life. He can save you. He can save your soul. He can forgive your sins. He can set you right with God and give you the guarantee of eternal life, a place in heaven with him. And he can do it from heaven, even while you're right here on earth. He's Lord over distance. I'm glad for the technology that allows us to enjoy what seems to me almost to be a miracle from distance. Here we are, not physically together, but able to be together in this way. Now, so now the story begins with a reminder of another miracle in verse 46. Verse 46 says, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. So th that was his first miracle. And J John recorded it as his first miracle. And in that miracle, he, he proved that he was Lord over time. Lord over time. He shortcutted the process of water turning into wine by quite a few months. <laughs> the water, water can turn to wine. And water turns to wine all the time. It just goes through the right process, right? But Jesus showed that he had power over time. Now he shows he has power over distance. Now let's look at this nobleman for a moment. We're gonna, I just want to emphasize five things about him in relation to his situation with his son. The first thing I want you to think about is the problem that he faced. It was a unique problem, the problem that he faced. It was a unique problem. It was a, it was a critical problem. His son is not only sick, he is at the very brink of death. Verse 46 says there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And then verse 47 says, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea, he went to him and he begged him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. He was close. He didn't know how much time he had left. He didn't know if his son had hours or moments, but he, his situation was critical. The problem that he faced was a son who was sick, who was just about to die, and there was nothing that he could do about it, even though he was from nobility, which would mean he, he was a man of means. He probably had money. He had, he had power. He could get people to do things for him. But there was nothing he could do for his son. He was a nobleman. He was, uh, some say he was probably from Herod's court, the court of Herod, a man of means. He's used to getting what he wants, but no matter what he tries, Nothing has been able to save his son. Not money, not power, nothing. And there's, there's no one that he can take his son to that can save him. They don't have remdesivir. They don't have hydroxychloroquine. There's no uh, convalescent plasma available for his son, right? He's got nothing. He's helpless. He's desperate. That's the problem that he faces. His son is sick. He's just about to die. And he can't do anything about it. I want you to think for a moment about the problem that you face. It's similar. You're not a Christian. You're not saved. If you've never had a time in your life when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to think about the problem you face. You are in your sins. You are separated from God. You are headed for eternal separation from God. The situation couldn't be any serious, any more serious. And your money can't save you. Your position in life can't save you. You cannot manipulate your way out of your situation. And you have no idea how much time you have left. Your clock is ticking. The sand is running quickly through the hourglass of your life. 
You don't know how many grains are left. That's the problem you face. Second, I want you to think about the person that he met. And this is the person that he would have to get to because he needed a miracle. Verse 47 says, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him. He went to Jesus. The man's only hope was Jesus Christ. Your only hope for the problem you face is Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you this. With everything going on in our world, with everything going on in our world, there is but one solution. There is but one solution. It's Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can change people's lives. He's the only one that can eradicate the sin of racism. He's the only one who can make your life what God intends your life to be. Programs, politics are useless in doing anything to cure the sin problem that there is in our lives, in our hearts, in our world. There's but one solution. Sometimes Christians need a reminder of that as well. There is only one solution. It's Jesus Christ. And the, our goal is to get the message out to as many as we can because he's changed our lives and he can change yours as well. And the gospel is still changing lives one heart at a time that comes to Christ. Christ changes him. Christ changes her. Well, he comes, he, heard, he hears, this nobleman hears that Jesus had come to Galilee specifically in Cana, where he made the water turn to wine. The only problem is uh, the nobleman is in Capernaum. Now, that's about 20 to 30 miles away from his location. He can't just jump in his Tesla and get there in 15 minutes. All right? he, well, he's a long way from where Jesus is. There's this distance. So I don't know how he makes the trip whether he does it on foot, on horseback, chariot, entourage, we're not told. But he does make the trip to get to Jesus because Jesus is his only hope and he has to get there. Meanwhile, he leaves his son behind. He doesn't know if he'll ever see his son again. He could be dead by the time he even gets to where Jesus is. But he comes to him. He gets to Christ. And if you will ever have the problem of your sins dealt with, if you will ever be in heaven, my friend, you will have to get to Jesus Christ. You will have to get to the Lord Jesus. Now, you don't need to travel 20 miles. It's a good thing because we can't go it hardly anywhere right now. You, won't, you don't have to travel at all. You know what? The Bible says that he is very near. He is very near. He's just a call away. You call out to him. He's right there. And he, so he gets to Jesus. When he comes to Jesus, he comes with his request, but I find it very interesting that Jesus doesn't ignore him at his arrival. He doesn't brush him off. He doesn't say, listen, you're, you're from the higher classes. You're from the noble class. I came for poor people. I came for the outcast. I didn't come for the rich and famous. Every soul needs Christ. And every soul can come to him in a time of need. It doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your situation, your circumstances. Jesus said this, whoever comes to me, John 6 and 37, whoever comes to me, I will never cast away. You can come to him and he'll, he'll, he will hear you. He will listen to you and he will save you if you put your trust in him. <clears throat> Notice that this man in all of his need didn't go to Herod for help. He didn't go to Herod for help, the king of Judea. He realized he needed the king of the Jews, and so he came to Jesus for help. He didn't come to the highest power in his region, the Herod. He came to Christ, the highest power in the universe. And you need to come to Christ as well for the problem that you face, the problem of your sin. And so there's the problem that he faced, the person that he met, I'll never forget when I met Jesus Christ and I received him as my savior and he has changed my life. He's changed so many of your lives as well. This is the person that you need to meet, the Lord Jesus. The problem he faced, the person he met, number three, the plea that he made, the plea that he made. So he, he makes this long trip either on foot 
or he's riding in, in a chariot, but he arrives in Cana where Jesus is. Listen to his plea, verse 47. He begged him, King James, he besought him that he would come down and heal his son. Then Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. But he says it again. No, verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, sir, come down. Come down before my child dies. This man is desperate. And Jesus is testing his faith, right? You have to, unless you see, you won't believe. So Jesus isn't going to let him see anything. All he's going to get is a word. What's he going to do with a word from the Lord? He says, sir, come down, come to the place. Uh, now, I'm sure this man was used to giving people orders. Sounds like he's giving out orders here, right? Come down before my child dies. And then he says it again, come down. Lord, come with me, come with me. He's not going, <laughs> the Lord isn't going to take the orders. He's going to give them. But by the, by the way, the man thought, right, that Jesus would have to be there where his son was. In other words, hop in the chariot, Lord. We don't know how much time we have left. My son is at the point of death. Get in the chariot. Come with me, and we'll get there as soon as we can. And maybe you can save my son if he's still alive. He thought Jesus would have to be there. Come down with me. But we've already pointed out that Jesus Christ is Lord over distance. Now, other people thought the same when they came to meet the Lord Jesus and they needed a miracle. Uh, you might remember the story of Jairus, who had a daughter that, it was, that, it was, that was at the point of death. And he says essentially the same thing to Jesus. He comes to Jesus. He says, he says, my daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her. So that she may be well and alive. In other words, you've got to be where she is. Put your hands on her and then she'll be, she'll be healed. Now, Jesus did go. But he, he didn't have to. <laughs> Other people thought the same thing. I thought about the woman with the issue of blood that came to Jesus. She, she was saying to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. She thought she had to. She thought Jesus had to physically be where she was to do something about her problem. Mary and Martha, same thing. They had a brother, Lazarus, who died. They were all friends of Jesus, and he got sick. They sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Jesus didn't come right away. And in the meantime, Lazarus died. Then Jesus comes, and you remember what Mary and Martha said to him? Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. In other words, you've got to be here. They all thought the same thing. Jesus had to be physically there to do a miracle. I'm glad he doesn't have to be physically anywhere to do a miracle. He is Lord over distance, and that's going to be evident in our story as well. But the plea that he makes, he says, Lord, come down with me. Please come down. My son is at the point of death. Number four, I want you to think about the promise he received. So what does Jesus say to him? <clears throat> After he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And the nobleman says, Lord, come down before my son die, uh, before my son dies. Jesus said to him, look at verse 50. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your son will live. Go your way. Your son will live. What would you do with that? What would you do with that? He's not going to see anything. He's just going to hear. Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe on me. By the way, when the Lord Jesus performed miracles, they were often called signs. You know why? They were signs pointing to who he was so that people would believe on him for everlasting life. He was far more interested in people putting their faith in him to receive everlasting life than putting their faith in him to do a physical act a miraculous act of healing. That's what he came to do. And so Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe, you won't put your confidence in me for salvation. And so now he tests the man, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna see anything. 
but I'll give you something to hear. I'll give you a promise. What are you going to do with it? He received this promise from Jesus. Go your way, your son lives. What would you do? Got no proof of anything. It's easy to say to somebody, go ahead, go away. Your son will be fine. He will live. It was enough for this man. It was enough for this man. He doesn't stop Jesus and say, no, 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 no. You've got to come down with me. This is serious. Don't just say something. Do something. When Jesus says something, he is doing something. He's giving his word. He's giving his promise. And having Christ's word was sufficient for this man because he leaves. It was good enough. I'm glad having the word of the Lord is still sufficient today. Because you know what? As I sit here in this chair up against this bookcase, I'm still depending on the word of the Lord for my salvation. Now, I don't have to keep depending on it to be saved. Once you put your confidence in Christ, you are saved and saved forever. But as I sit here, I'm depending on Christ. I'm depending on his word. And his word to me was John 3 and 16. I know it's his word to me because it says it in the verse. It says it's for whoever. And so it's a promise to you. John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's a promise to me. I'm the whoever. In good old King James language, I'm the whosoever. And I'm so glad he gave me that promise. I've received, have you received the promise of God's word? So this man, the promise he received was go your way, your son lives. Finally, the last thing, number five, I want you to think about the peace that he enjoyed, the peace that he enjoyed. So what happens? What does he do? The end of verse 50 says, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. He, it was enough. He went his way. And verse 51, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to improve. And they said unto him, yesterday. Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. That's an interesting thing, yesterday. What would you do? Jesus says, you go your way, your son lives. I'll tell you what I would do. I would go home as quickly as I could and, as, and get there, if I could, that same day. Now, this man believed the promise of the Lord Jesus so strongly that he I guess he went part of the way that day and the rest of the way the next. He had peace. He had confidence that what Christ said to him was enough. Because then his servants meet him and they say, yesterday he was healed. He had peace. The word of God gave him peace. He knew his son was going to be fine. He was resting in the word of the Lord and he had peace. And so he asked them, he says, oh, by the way, what time did he start to improve? They're, they're saying, improve nothing it wasn't like a gradual kind of improvement they the servants report a complete instant recovery they you're never gonna believe this yesterday at the seventh hour on the clock <laughs> it happened in a moment the fever left it was gone instantly i've never had that happen i i've had a lot of fevers and i'm sure you've had them too could you imagine being here? There you are lying in bed. You're sweating. You got 102 fever. You're in absolute misery. And in one second, it's 98.6. I don't know what that would feel like. Probably quite amazing. And that's what happened for this young man. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And he was immediately, instantly saved when Jesus said, your son lives. A miracle happened. I'm glad the Lord Jesus still, from a distance, saves. He saves completely. <clears throat> he saves instantly. He can do the same for you. And if you receive his word, the promises of his word, he will give you peace. You can rest in the assurance of his word and have peace. Because Christ has done something already for the great problem of our sin. He went to a cross. And on the cross, he suffered for sins. 
the just one in the place of the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He's Lord over that distance, the distance that exists between us and God because of our sins. Christ can remove it. He can bring us to God by the work of the cross if you put your trust in him and you will have peace. He will change your life. And he has changed so many already. Let me just give you some closing lessons as we finish. I wrote down six things to remember from this story. Number one, number one, sickness is no respecter of persons. Sickness is no respecter of persons. Old people get sick. <clears throat> Young people get sick. And thinking of COVID-19, right? It affects everybody. Lots of people get it. Rich people. Poor people, people from higher classes, people from lower classes, if you will. It, affect, it affects everyone. It afflicts everyone. And, and the sickness of sin affects us all. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sickness is no respecter of persons. Number two, distance is not a barrier to God's power. Distance is not a barrier to God's power. <clears throat> And I'm glad because, well, some of you might know some people tonight that are far away, far away from God, far away from wanting to hear anything about God, about Christ. I'm so glad that God can reach them where they are. He's got all the resources of the universe at his disposal, and he can reach people, and he can save people from a distance. Distance is not a barrier to God's power. Number three, hardship might be a blessing in disguise. Hardship may be a blessing in disguise. It was for him. And it wasn't a blessing just because his son got better. No, the blessing came after that. Because after that, he believed in Christ. He was, if you will, he was saved because of the hardship that came into the home of this man. He saw what Christ could do and he put his faith in him. And not only him, but others came. Hardship may be a blessing in disguise. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you're going through tonight. I know a lot of people are going through lots of difficulty in our country, in our world. But if it leads us closer to Christ, if it brings us to him, it's a blessing. Hardship may be a blessing in disguise. Number four, seeing and believing is inferior to hearing and believing. Seeing and believing is inferior to hearing and believing. Now, look at what Jesus says in verse 48. He said, and th this was his frustration, right? Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. You'll only believe in me if you see something. Here's a man who didn't see anything. And yet he believed. All he did was hear. He heard and believed. And that's better. In fact, you remember what Jesus said to one of his disciples, Thomas, after his resurrection? He said to Thomas, blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. In fact, Jesus said this, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. And that's the greatest blessing of all that you could receive is hearing his word and believing on him. There's the promise of everlasting life. Seeing and believing is inferior to hearing and believing. Number five, faith can start small and spread far. Faith can start small and spread far. First, this man had faith that Jesus could do something for his son, or he never would have come to Jesus. He believed he could do something for his son. He had faith in him. Second, he had faith that when Jesus said, go your way, your son lives, that that was enough, because he went. He heard the word, put his faith in the word, and he left. Third, he had faith in Christ for salvation. That's what verse 53 says. So the, the verse 53 says, so the father knew 
that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, your son lives, what was the result? And he himself believed. He had already believed that the promise of Jesus, but now he believed on the Lord Jesus for his, for his salvation. So that faith is starting to spread. It was small. He believed Jesus could do something for his son. Then he believed what Jesus said for, about his son. Now he puts his faith in Christ for salvation. The end of verse 53 says, and so did his whole household. Faith can start small and spread far. Finally, number six, last closing lesson. When Jesus says it's done, it's done. When Jesus says it's enough, it's enough. When Jesus says it's finished, it's finished. What does he say? Go your way, your son lives. That's good enough. It's done. Go your way, your son lives. And this is how he showed that he was Lord over distance. When Jesus was hanging on a cross, he showed he was Lord over distance. And he said, it's done. He said, it's finished. Paying the price for our sins and removing the separation that existed between us and God, he removed it. Come to him. Trust him. Believe on him. And he will bring you to God. Because of the work that he did at the cross. Again, Peter's words, Christ also has once suffered for sins. The just in the place of the unjust that he might bring us to God. Many of us, I certainly was, but many of us listening were once far away from God. Far away in our sins. But we have been brought near by the blood of of Christ, as Paul says in Ephesians 2. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You can be brought near too because Jesus Christ is still Lord over distance. And still from his right hand in heaven, he is doing a miracle for life after life in this world. And there are many in this world that need a miracle. Maybe you're one of them. You can have it. Christ can save you from heaven if you'll put your trust in him.